to begin the service with the reading of um, the opening scripture, Faye Ellen was scheduled. Yep, Avar 17, 39 to 42. Behold, this is my doctrine. Whosoever repenteth and cometh unto me, the same as my church. Whosoever declareth more or less than this is not of me, but is against me. Therefore, he is not of my church. Now behold, whosoever is of my church and endureth in the, my church to the end, him will I establish upon my rock, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. And now remember the words of he who has the life and the light of the world, your Redeemer, your Lord, and your God. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So it has been a year since we officially organized. Um, and welcome back to all of you that were with us last time and welcome to all of you that are new. The main announcements that I have is, uh, well, there's a couple of things. One, when Christine gets back on and she gets her, her mic straightened out, she's gonna go over our yearly report uh, on the finances. Uh, in the meantime, I wanna let you know that we did publish the second edition of the Ordinances of the Saints. It is available on Kindle and other ebook platforms and you can get it on print only from our store on Lulu. There's a link uh, under scriptures on our website. Uh, there's been a lot of changes. We have introduced a congregation in South Carolina. They came on board back in August and there's been a number of changes uh, as, we, as we have been growing throughout the year. Uh, Christine's gonna give us her report on the finances for 2020 th or 2019 through 2020. So for the financial report, I'm just gonna go over quickly the um, donations that we received um, for the year. And I apparently wasn't telling the truth because it's not loading. There it goes, okay. Um, so for the total um, incoming donations um, for the year, and we use a fiscal year of um, April 1st through March 31st, um, that is $906 total donations that we received. Um, a majority of that was um, donated towards the general fund. We had $15 donated uh, to technology fund in particular and $20 um, donated to the missionary fund in particular. Um, we had uh, $186.55 um, income from uh, publishing of uh, different materials and that goes to the scripture fund. Um, And our year-end uh, account balance uh, is $461.55. Um, and $275 of that is um, already allotted to the application for our 401c3. But that will also be on next year's. Um, and then quickly go over the Expenses that we had, um, most of the expenses that we have uh, recorded um, for this year were um, under the categories of technology and business expenses. So we're talking about things like uh, ma maintaining and updating the website, um, meeting host fees, um, uh, PO box, things like that. Um, and then that total was, um, and that also includes also uh, charitable donations as well. That total was 1,055.83 um, was the recorded expenses. Um, the charitable donations uh, for the year were a total of $100. And that broke down to $90 donation towards um, uh, Beaver Creek um, Fish, which is a local food bank, and um, a $10 individual donation to a woman in need. 
um, and that about sums it up. Thank you. So the last thing I want to go over at the announcements is uh, I want to thank everyone that has donated and, and given because that's how we're able to pay for things. Uh, this, you know, Zoom and, and everything else, none of this stuff is free, so it, it does cost money. Uh, the reason why we're reading this during the announcements is because we want to be an organization of full transparency. We want you guys to know if, you're, if you are giving, what you're giving to, what you're giving for. And you may notice that 10% of what we brought in was given out in charitable donations because that is, that is our tithe as a fellowship. That is our donation back, giving back to the Lord. And we do not give to anything within our own movement or within the Latter-day Saint movement. We want to reach outside of where we are uh, to let other, others know that, that we're here for them. We're, we're not exclusive, we're inclusive. Uh, final thing I want to go over with you guys is I'm going to share my screen for a moment. This is the new tithes and offerings page. And if you click, it goes over some information. If you click on this, it takes you to PayPal. And here it allows you to put in however much you want. You can schedule a monthly donation so that it's automatically pulls. And you can also tell us what the money will be used for. There were two incident. I'm sorry. There were two incidences where people said specifically, "I'm giving you this much. I'd like it to be used for this purpose." And so that's what we did. We we put that money towards the purpose that they requested. So if you say you want something to go to the, the scripture committee or the missionary fund or IT or general wealth, welfare, that's where it will go. Uh, if you just do a blank donation, we will just put it wherever we need it. So. This will give you guys a better idea of how we'll be doing this moving forward. So those are the announcements for this year. Thank you. And I turn the time back over to Victoria. Dear friends and fellow saints and friends of the fellowship, I welcome you tonight as we begin our official service. Beginning on the program listed as a moment of beautification with the opening hymn. Following my introduction here, Boyd will uh, give us a reading of a scripture. Following that, I am inviting everyone to, and if you have children in attendance, to bring your gifts to the table, as I specified in the video that was left it's on the page where the program is listed. I hope you also have prepared your communion so you can take a communion with us at this, which will follow immediately. Um, following Boyd's reading, we will have this meditation where you, during this time, you can bring your gifts and put them in front of your cameras so we can see everyone and the contribution that they're bringing to join our hearts together during this time. And I thank everyone who has chosen to turn their video on so we can see their faces. As I know it creates tension for some, but it's a joy just to see everyone's face. So thank you very much. So Boyd, I'll turn it over to you to read this scripture. Behold, the Lord is everywhere and in every place. Therefore, thou art not alone. He, obs he observes both the good and wicked in every place. The worthy revere the Lord in righteousness. Unite the people as one in the Lord, in order that the people of God be not divided. Yea, work for the sake of the heavens. I invite everyone to bring their gifts to the table. James, you want to open, offer the opening prayer? Sure. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Parent, we are so grateful for, for you to help us bring us together today. In this uncertain time, we are especially grateful for the technology that we are using to make this meeting possible. Please watch over it as we use it 
to further the mission of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to be with us as we get to know each other, consider scripture, and to learn about you. Inspire the speakers tonight that they may use their words to reach our souls and open our minds to your inspiration and guidance. We also ask for you to keep a watchful eye on our family members, our neighbors, and coworkers to keep them healthy and safe as they are, that they go about their business or be at home. Please inspire our doctors and nurses and others to be healing hands and provide comfort and, as humanity battles this horrible virus. And please put us in the right place at the right time and to, uh, to put us in a position to, to share your love and, and your story with people that we know, both near and far. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. We will now continue with the sacrament of our communion service at this time. So, Dave. So. You, go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, no, thank you. Um, so we want to try something a little bit different as we take the sacrament today. Um, Christine is the high priestess, so she will be blessing the, the bread and the wine or water. Typically what we seem to do is we'll say the prayers one right after another, and then we'll pause for a song. And then we will use that as an opportunity to meditate on the Lord. But we wanted to try something different uh, for this service. And, and that is, we're going to say a prayer and then we're going to stop and then all of us at the same time will take the sacrament we'll say the bread and then the water and the wine and i will see if we can try to coordinate this as best we can to all take it as one uh, so so this will be a a sacrament in unity is, does that make sense to everyone okay um and if you're not participating in the sacrament, that's that's fine. Uh, but that's an option that's on the table. Now, before we begin, the other thing that I wanted to express is we are a non-denominational movement. We're, we're not a traditional church. We don't have an official creed. And we do not have any special things that anyone has to do to join us in taking the sacrament. This is a universal sacrament. Whether you choose to take it or not is between you and the Lord. It is open to all. Christine will, will bless for everyone, and then we will partake. So, Christine, I'm going to turn the time over to you now. Oh, God, the Eternal Father, we ask thee in the name of thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this bread to the souls of all those who partake of it, that they may eat in remembrance of the body of thy Son, and witness unto thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they are willing to take upon them the name of thy Son, and always remember him, and keep his commandments which he hath given them, that they may always have his Spirit to be with them. Amen. O God, the Eternal Father, we ask Thee in the name of Thy Son, Jesus Christ, to bless and sanctify this wine to the souls of all those who drink of it, that they may do so in remembrance of the blood of Thy Son, which was shed for them, that they may witness unto Thee, O God, the Eternal Father, that they do always remember Him, that they may have His Spirit to be with them. Amen. Okay, we will continue the service with the discussion brought to our, us by Alexei Christopher Matanovich, apostle and co-president of the Quorum of Twelve. He's going to talk to us briefly about scripture as we go now into our next part of our service today where we will start getting into our business elements. And these are conversations. So we're just 
uh, something that we want to actively participate together in and not just sit there like we are receiving. So it's a two-way flow, a figure eight flow between our hearts and the speaker of the hour. Thank you, Christopher. It's important to talk about what scripture is, which is, <clears throat> it comes from revelation. And it's also the heart and soul of the restoration, which began 200 years ago from this year with the first vision of the prophet Joseph Smith. Now at this time, I also feel it's important to, to talk about faith because as you know that there's a, a great plague that's going across the whole world at this time. And a lot of people are in confusion. There's chaos. There's great pressure being placed on all of the systems that are created by human beings. But I want to say that none of this will affect the kingdom of God, which his work, his plan of salvation, which was laid before the foundations of the world, cannot be frustrated. The work of the restoration cannot be frustrated. The rolling forth of the kingdom of God cannot and will not be frustrated, no matter what happens. So on that score, we should not be worried. Now there's a lot of people that are impacted by the coronavirus. There are many thousands of people that will end up going back to their maker because of this. And for them, I pray with sincerity of my heart, I pray that the Holy Spirit prepares those souls for going back to our Father and comforts them at their hour of passing and also the families and the people that they leave behind. And for the rest of us, it's my prayer that we receive a glimpse of eternity in the recognition of how brief this life really is. Now, our Father has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and a sound mind. And as our master has said many times, I say, fear not, do not be afraid. Rather be comforted by the comforter who's within you and within me. That comforter resides with us and is also the source of all revelation. And what we call Holy Scripture is written revelation. It's the word of God to humanity. And the word of God is God. And it's in us. It's in all of us. That spirit is always speaking to us. We just have to listen for it. And when we read scripture that's written down, we have to read it with that same spirit that inspired it in the first place. Because it's not the writings themselves that will teach us the truth of all things, but it's the spirit. And I testify to 
the knowledge of God's existence and, and of revelation, and that he sent his prophets and apostles who, who wrote these words. But I also testify that they're human beings, no different than you or I, and that what was possible for them is also possible for us. As a matter of fact, we could read the words and not get anything from it unless we gain a testimony of their truthfulness that can only come by revelation. It is that Holy Spirit that testifies to each of us that God is real and that this has value. That knowledge that this is value, that this is God speaking to us, is revelation. And we can trust it. That knowledge that it's true. And we, God says that he proves all his words. He sends witnesses, he sends proofs, he shows signs. We don't seek signs and we don't demand signs. But if we have faith, we will have signs. God will teach us things, will take our veil off of our mind that we can see. Now, 200 years ago, Joseph Smith came in the same vein as Moses and Jesus and many prophets before to restore law, to restore the truth of the gospel. Some of the plain and precious things had fallen away. And I testify that that restoration is ongoing today. It hasn't stopped. And we have many signs and proofs. The, the fact that Joseph Smith revealed to us the truths of doctrines that mainstream Christianity had, had looked and seen in their Bible texts millions of times, millions of eyes laid across them and did not comprehend their value or their meaning, like baptism for the dead. The very structure of the church being prophets and apostles, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and so forth. These things have escaped most of Christendom because we need the Holy Spirit to teach us. And that's what Joseph brought back the possibility for, that today we can do as he did to go to God to ask for wisdom, to open ourselves up to that spirit, to teach us from these texts. Now, James Strang also showed us that the second greatest commandment that Jesus said, love thy neighbor, was missing from the Decalogue. And it was plain and, and easy to see in hindsight but nobody ever saw it. Christians and Jews would argue about what the Ten Commandments are, but nobody came to the conclusion that there's only nine of them. And this was a sign to us that James was a prophet and that God really did reveal something to him. And for those of us who receive that sign, receive a great assurance of faith. So I'd like to share a revelation that came by the Holy Spirit two years ago to me as I was reading something similar that, as far as I know, many eyes in Christendom have read. But the Holy Spirit, even though I had read many, many times these words, showed me something different on one occasion. And I've, I've only shared this with one other person. So I want to read starting in, in Mark chapter 3. Sorry, chapter 4. And he began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got in the boat and sat on it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he taught the many things in parables. 
And in his teaching, he said to them, listen, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it had not much soil and immediately it sprang up since it had no depth of soil and when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked it and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and brought forth grain growing up and increasing and yielding 30 fold and 60 fold and a hundred fold. And he said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus says that a lot. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the ears he's talking about is the Holy Spirit. The one with the Holy Spirit will get the true meaning. And when he was alone, those who were with him, with the 12, asked him concerning the parables. So this is not just to the 12, but this is to the disciples outside of the 12. He's got different sized groups of people and he gives different pieces of information to them. And as you recall, even the 12, he didn't tell them who he was. He waited for Peter to discover it by revelation. And that's very important. So he says, to you it has been given the secret of the kingdom of God. But for those outside, everything is in parables so that they may indeed see, but not perceive and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn again and be forgiven. I almost want to say, a lot of people ask, what's wrong with them repenting and being forgiven? But I think he's saying so that they're not condemned, so that they have time to, for, to repent and be forgiven, because if they knew all things, then they'd have responsibilities that they don't have so that they, they now have time to be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? He said, so if you don't understand this parable, how then will you understand all the parables? And that's really important because he gave them this parable and a key to interpreting it and said that in it, you can interpret these other parables. He says, the sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word which is sown in them. And these, in like manner, are the ones sown upon rocky ground, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy, and they have no root in themselves. So when the tribulations of the world come, like now, if our hearts are fertile soil, and if this, the seed, which is the word of God, which is God himself, is rooted in us, we will endure. They have no root in themselves. They endure for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones that are sown among thorns and those thorns and those hear the word, but the cares of the world and the delight in riches and the desire for other things choke the word and it proves unfruitful. But those sown upon the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30 fold, 60 fold and a hundred fold. And you, the faith comes by the, by the Spirit, by, by revelation, by hearing the Word, by receiving Christ himself, who is the Word, into ourselves. And there's different people that do different things with it, and we see that. And I, I, I thought of, like, Mother Teresa would be a good example of somebody who really produced a hundredfold, spent the rest of her life in service to her fellow beings. 
But I thought it was important that there was no disparagement here for those producing 30-fold because they're producing fruit. They are good soil. So we're not encouraged by this to go out and judge between and say this person was better soil than this person. This person did more. Look at how much this person is doing. Because of all of these groups that are producing, he says they're good soil. So he says, take heed what you hear. The measure you give will be the measure you get, and still more will be given to you. For the one who has not, even that what he has will be taken. And he says, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed upon the ground and should sleep and rise night and day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He knows not how. Now, as we go and we, we hear the word and then we deliver the word to others, we testify to our revelation, to receiving the testimony of who Christ is, and it grows into the kingdom. But we know not how. We don't get to judge how another is to receive the word or what they're supposed to do with it. We just go and spread it. And it's God that works his miracle that allows it to grow and it grows into the kingdom. The earth produces of itself first the blade and then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And when the grain is ripe at once, he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So we get a second parable about the seed, but it's the same parable. And he said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? It is like the grain of mustard seed. So again, it starts with the seed. Which, when sown in the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. And when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all trees. And puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. And with many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. So as they're able to hear it. This is important because throughout our lives, we're able to hear things at certain times that we're not able to hear at other times. And when we share a word with somebody, aren't we anxious for them to get what we've gotten out of it? And haven't you been excited that God has revealed something to you and you go to share it, you think that they're gonna discover the same thing that you discovered, but they don't, they don't see it. I shared something the other day and someone said, well, we just don't know. And I was like, yes, we don't know, do we? <clears throat> On that day, oh, that's the end of the parables in Mark, but I want to, I want to go over to Matthew and bear with me, please. I'll make it, uh, I'll go through it as quickly as I can. But I want to go through the parables again. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the sea, and the great crowds gathered about him so that he got into the boat and sat there. And he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Remember what the birds are. So, and in this chapter, he also gives the, the enemy hath done this parable about sowing the seed, and the enemy comes and corrupts the seed of revelation. So, he says, the birds came and devoured it. Remember, the birds is the devil. He takes it away. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they had not much soil, and immediately they sprung up, and they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell upon thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil, brought forth grain, 
some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples said to them, to him, why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For to him, who has will be given, and he who has, and he will have an abundance. But from him who has not, even that which he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. With them, indeed, it is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, saying, you shall understand, you shall indeed hear, but not understand. You shall see, but not perceive. For this people's heart has grown dull, and their ears are heavy of hearing, and their eyes have, they have closed, lest they should perceive with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and turn for me to heal them. Blessed are your eyes, for they see. And your ears, for they hear. Truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see and did not see it. And to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in his heart. The birds. As for the one who's sown on the rocky ground, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself but endures for a while. And when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among thorns, this is he who hears the word, but the cares of the world or the delight in riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what is sown on good soil, this is he who hears the word and understands it, produces 160 and 30. Another parable he put before them, saying the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field, revelation and scripture. But while men were sleeping, the enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. This testifies to our restoration with Joseph Smith, because the scriptures that had been recorded also contained interpolations, also contained things that, that were impure, because they weren't kept in purity by the institutions of religion who had power. That's why we need restorers like Joseph Smith. We need revelation. So when the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then has it weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Then do you want to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds, you pull up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned and gather the wheat into my barn. We and the fellowship in our pursuit of scripture and revelation, we're performing the restitution of all things today. Because this is the end times when we will separate the wheat from the chafe. And we will gather it into the barn and the rest will be burned. Another parable he put before them saying the kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed which the man took and sowed in the field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown into the greatest of shrubs and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Now, if the scriptures had become corrupt, who corrupted them? And we, and we need the pure word to discern what is of God and what is not. Well, who corrupted them is the institutions of religion, the ones who come into power, who control people, who become dogmatic, who stop following 
the word, the spirit, because the institution becomes too large when there's people at the top and they have too many people counting on them and they can't risk putting the foolishness of the things of God above the wisdom of the world and they want to please people and they don't want to make a mistake and they stop following the spirit because they're following their ego. That's when priestcraft starts. That's when apostasy starts. That's when they are not interpreting the pure word anymore, but they're looking at the weeds or they sow weeds in it because Satan is so that in their hearts. That's what the restoration is all about. And right here he tells us because the seed begins with the word. Just like in the first vision, the word comes in purity to Joseph Smith, and it's just a seed. And it grows like it did with Jesus, like it did with Moses. And it becomes the Levitical temple priesthood that was oppressing the people that Jesus had to come and cast them out of the, the temple. Or when the the movement that Jesus started grew into the Orthodox Church and began to began to persecute the peaceable followers of, of Christ, as Nephi says. So he says it right here. When it becomes an institution, an organized religion, it says it grows into the tallest of trees and the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. And he gave the key in the first parable. The birds of the air is the devil. So when the movement grows into a large institution, the devil comes and rests in its branches. And that's why we need a restoration. That's why Joseph came. That's the work he did. That's the work we are continuing to do in his honor, in his legacy, in his footsteps, receiving the word who is Jesus Christ. And I bear my testimony that Christ lives and that he speaks to all of us and he gives us these revelations so that we can serve him, so that we can grow into the people that he wants us to be, even his people, even his kingdom. In his name, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you, Alexi. We will now have um, Dave Fairman. Did you want to speak on the on this at this time? Okay, thank you. Um, so first off, I I want to thank Alexei for his message, and the the big point, the big takeaway that I got from that is that revelation is the rock that the, the work of Christ is built upon. We can't do anything without revelation. And so what we're going to do now, I'm going to go over a couple of things for us to vote on, and we're going to do a symbolic vote at this time. Um, but really, anybody that wants to vote can, can mail, email me, or us, I should say, their votes at info at cjccf.org, or they can go on each one of the various things that we're submitting. Um, but I want to start off with leadership. I would first like to thank Michael Clark for his work as a member of the 70 over the United Kingdom. He had to step down from this role, but I would like at this time, I propose that we give him a vote of thanks for the work that he did. Do, do so by the raise of the right hand. Thank you. Um, and we are currently looking for a replacement if anyone is watching this and video after this uh, for the UK. Uh, and as Alan will tell you, he's always looking for 70. If you the, have desires to serve, you are called to the work. Yes, that's exactly it. That's exactly what the Lord told Joseph Smith Sr. Um, 
So the, the next thing that to vote on as far as leadership is the Council of Elders. And if you go to the leadership page, you can see there's five of us there. Um, so we're gonna do a, a vote now. Those that sustain the Council of Elders as recorded on the website, raise your hand. And those that object may do so now. And below that is the Council of 50. And we'll be adding to this as people receive calls from the Lord. So those that sustain these, you can do so by the uplifted hand. And those that do not do so now, please. Thank you. Now again, if you would like to vote to sustain or not sustain anyone, please email us at info at cjccf.org to let us know. And we will be taking votes until the 10th of April. Now on the pending scriptures, the Council of Elders, we sat together on numerous occasions putting this list together. And I'm not gonna go into great detail over these. Joseph Smith wrote a letter. It's typically called the happiness letter. Uh, it's there for you to vote on or reject. The apostolic charge, this is what Oliver Cowdery read to the original apostles in the original Church of Christ before they went out in Kirtland, Ohio. And it does include the revelation Joseph Smith received before the church was organized, uh, before the movement was organized about gathering the apostles. Next on the list is Hava Pratt. She is a restorationist prophetess. We were put in touch with her writings and she speaks quite a bit on building community, which is something that's very important to us. And we felt that the words of this prophetess were relevant to what we are doing and to our movement. So we are offering those at this, at this time also. Um, I'm going to skip over mine for a moment and go to Alexei. He has given us an epistle and four revelations for us to take a look at and vote on. And uh, I just want to bear you my testimony that there's some really good stuff in here on um, what it means to be a witness, how to receive a witness, and how to be one. Uh, and in line with that, Scott Stover, who is a friend of the fellowship, also gave us revelation that he received on being one. Now, going back to have a Pratt being a prophetess, we also have two revelations from Apostle Victoria Ramirez. And I want to mention that these are very important, I believe, because they're opening us up to the divine feminine. Hava is a prophetess, so we're receiving revelation from a prophetess just as they did in the Old Testament, and just as we saw a little bit of in the New Testament. And Victoria is giving us further information about the divine feminine. So we've been so focused on the patriarchy for so long, this is information that is good to help guide us in this new direction the so on the kabbalistic tree of life you have three pillars on the right you have on the right you have wisdom and mercy and that's the feminine and on the left you have knowledge and judgment and that is the masculine and as we've seen over time the patriarchy focuses on what do you know and how should we judge? And the one thing that's been missing from the gospel is the wisdom to help us understand the knowledge and the mercy to temper that justice. So it is very important that we come in alignment with God by seeing all of these aspects. And so that's why I feel that these particular revelations are so important. Um, the revelations that I received 
most of these are revelations to help guide us in what we need to do as a fellowship moving forward. But there are two that I would like to point out because we've had our, our mission statement. Uh, and these are things that originally my wife and I put together um, through prayer and, and seeking Lord's guidance. But these two revelations, uh, come ye Israel and make ready the new Jerusalem. These are messages from the Lord that truly define what we are called to do as a fellowship. Come ye Israel, lets us know that the days of the Gentiles are now past. And we see exactly what Joseph Smith prophesied would happen back in March of 1831 in Kirtland, Ohio. He said that that generation shall not pass until they see an overflowing scourge. It shall cover the land and not be moved. And we are seeing that right now. It talks about earthquakes. We're seeing earthquakes. Um, they're not destroying the world, but they are a sign that God's work is continuing. It is moving forward. We're not stuck. We are on that path that he has set for us as a people. Make Ready the New Jerusalem focuses on, no, I'm sorry, and Coming Israel focuses on what it means to be Israel. Make Ready the New Jerusalem focuses on what we're supposed to do as Israel. The idea of unifying the saints, creating and I'm not saying that we're supposed to take the lead or take charge of this, but we are to encourage these other denominations, all of the denominations of the restoration, to come to the table and see how we can start working together in Christ and set aside this one true churchness, if you will. Um, so out of all of these revelations, those two I feel are the most important because God's work is moving forward with or without us. And I personally want to be moving forward with him. Now, one last thing I'd like to say, um, Alexei talked a lot about the need for a revelation. And one of the things that he mentioned was the first vision. In the first vision, God condemned the creeds of the denominations of the world at that time. Why? Because the creeds are what excluded people. I do want to make it clear that according to our bylaws, we have two scriptures in the canon, the Bible and the Book of Mormon. Anyone that wishes to worship with us or become a member of the fellowship, it doesn't really matter what we vote on. It doesn't really matter what we choose. Scripture is very, very personal. So no one has to believe that anything we sustain in Scripture is Scripture. And anybody who wants to come to us and say, hey, I really like this. God speaks to me through this. I believe it's Scripture. We love them and we accept that because we have an open canon. Now, it's not binding on us, but that doesn't mean that God's not speaking to us through it or to that individual through it. And then God can speak through that individual because he has received this scripture or, or she has received the scripture. So please keep in mind that we're not trying to create a lockstep program. What we're trying to do here is discern what the Lord wants us to do as the fellowship of Jesus Christ. So please pray on these things, read them, and let us know what your vote is before April 10th, so that we can together as one move forward in Christ. Victoria? Okay, um, moving forward, I want to introduce Alan to speak regarding fellowship and unity, regarding the congregation he gets kind of involved with establishing in physical in a physical location here in the United States. So, Alan? Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm on my phone, so I'm not going to have any uh, video this evening. 
but yeah, I, I want to talk about fellowship building, community building, and how we this looks like a reality in our current uh, mindset within our current culture, and how it looks within everything that we're doing. Most of us are spread throughout the United States and spread throughout different parts of the world. Um, well, sadly, we're all in the United States again, just the United States, but um, mainly the groups that we're going to be running into are three types of people that I have found out. It's either people that are one former LDS or former restoration I identify as a former restoration denomination members. Another group are going to be um, other outsiders of other Christian denominations that do not feel welcome within their own denomination. And the last group are going to be those that are completely in church and have no concept of what organized religion looks like because they were never brought up in it and you just randomly run into those people. So something that we've had success here in South Carolina is that we're able to not only communicate with those of a restoration tradition, but we're also able to communicate with those outside of that tradition, outside of the Christian tradition completely. And that is through, honestly, community building activities. And what I mean by that is that we're not talking about establishing a temple in the middle of the town and building what a new Nauvoo or anything like that. I'm talking about establishing little enclaves of support systems. Because honestly, we're called to be called we're called to be a peculiar people among all people, which means we're called to reach out to those that are not included within our groups. We're not called to isolate ourselves. We're not called to make others conform to our ideals or our culture. We're not called to go out and force our will upon those around us. We're called to be that peculiar people so we can go out and honestly create these Zionic communities by being around those. And we see this in the early forms of the restoration of the Council of 50. The Council of 50 was established to work with people outside of the early LDS Church, the early Church of Christ, and they included members of prominent society, business leaders, and they worked towards building a better community. And that's what we need to do, even on our Council of 50, as it continues up to the point where we fully organize. And after that, that organ of our church or our movement of because we are a part of the universal Christian church, our church, we are Christians, we are part of the same church. As Lutherans, we're a part of the same church as LDS, we're a part of the same church as Church of Christ, as fundamentalists. We are all one church. We have to be able to use that organ of the Council of 50 and its original intent to build outside of that, to build outside of denominations, to build outside of even our faith. We need to be able to sit down with a Muslim. We need to be able to sit down with the Hindu, with the Buddhists, and sit down and come to a common understanding and agreement on how to propel society forward so that there will be no more poromongous. There will be no more hungry. There'll be no more people that are living in what would be considered abject poverty because it's up to us to build the world into the image of what Christ would want it to be and not the image of what we deem is necessary to have what we need within our own little tribal group. Because if we set out and to create another church, we'll stay small, we'll stay insignificant. But if we set out to create a community, we're gonna grow, we're gonna grow rapidly, we're gonna grow quickly, and we're gonna be able to grow beyond what we are into something that is more beautiful and more loving and more Christ-like in ways that we cannot even understand at this moment. Already since the, the first general conference and since the first time meeting Dave, this movement has grown rapidly. This movement has grown in ways I never thought I would see it grow this rapidly. We also have the ability to communicate with each other over distances. Each of us have our own little niche ideas and niche things that we're really good at. 
but it's the community building that we as a whole, as an organization need to embrace. And it's not saying, oh, call it Zion, that city on the hill. I'm saying we need to establish the stakes of Zion wherever we are. And to, plant, and to raise that tent up, the tent should cover the whole earth. It shouldn't just cover Missouri. It shouldn't cover Utah. It shouldn't cover Ohio or South Carolina. It should cover the whole earth. It, it should be wherever two or three saints are gathered. We're able to establish those communities. Mm -hmm. We're able to do what we are called to do. I know that this is a work we have been called to do. I know it has been confirmed to me. I know that whenever we go off the path of trying to do this work, we're gonna be met with resistance that we haven't been met with before. But as long as we put our heads together, as long as we put our hearts together and work in unity, no matter what group we are from, we can advance the cause to bounds and means that we even ourselves tonight can even dream of. Build this community by establishing a core group, reach out to those that are in need, be prepared for those that are angry, give them solace, give them comfort, let them yell, let them be angry. Eventually they'll resolve their anger. And once this happens, they can be an instrumental tool and forwarding the calls and the work we are disciples of the one and true living god that means we are called to represent him on this earth we are called to represent him in our actions and our deeds and our words it's great to have scripture it's great to have priesthood it's great to have organization but if, at the end of the day if all we become are those that are like the zoramites that are just concerned about the riches, the concern about the ornate things, then we are nothing. So we need to do this. We need to build these things. We've had success here in South Carolina because we're not asking anyone to even join the Christian faith. We're asking people just to love one another. And the whole precept of the gospel is built upon that one law, which is love. Going forward, we will be establishing manuals on how to do this and i am around to help with those things also and if you have any questions please feel free to call me please feel free to email me and i say these things in the name of jesus christ amen thank you brother alan uh we have our closing where Lori ann will read a scripture and then our closing probably offered by christian so I'm going to turn it over to Lorianne. Okay, this is 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic and love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult but with blessing, because to this you were called, so that you may inherit the blessing. For whosoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from the deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayers. But the face of the Lord <clears throat> is against those who do evil. And so to keep the Lord's face, we must live in harmony with one another. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, King of the universe, who made us holy with his commandments and commanded us to wrap ourselves in atonement. O oh, Adonai, deal bountifully with thy servant, that I 
may live and keep thy word. O El Elyon, open now our eyes, that we may behold wondrous things out of thy law. El Olam, we are strangers in the earth. Hide not thy commandments from us. El Roy, our souls breaketh for the longing that it hath unto thy judgments at all times. El Shaddai, thou hast rebuked and proud are the proud that are cursed, which do err from thy commandments. Elohim, remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. O Hashem, princes also did speak against us, but thy servants did meditate in thy statutes. O Yahweh, thy testimonies also are my delight and my counselors. Dear Heavenly Father, I wish safety on all who believe in thy name and all who have yet to know thy truth, that all those on the front lines are guided and protected by the Holy Spirit and thy angels, that they will succeed in saving as many lives and perhaps turning them to the light of Christ. And I say this in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight, and uh, we appreciate your participation in this momentous evening.